Yeah, I'm going to talk to you about probabilistic approaches to limit state um, uh, equations. Um, it's going to focus on Monte Carlo, Monte Carlo simulation. So we use a lot of these when we're actually um, doing risk calculations. I'm sure you guys have heard of Monte Carlo before. If not been there, I have not. Um, but these, uh, you can also use reliability methods such as first order, second moment to uh, kind of do some kind of the same thing. But this is really kind of written to um, help with nodes in an event tree when we do risk analysis on specific failure modes, like a slope stability problem. Um, Post-liquefaction embankment stability is what we'll look at in, in, in this uh, as one example. Foundation red rock, rock wedge stability problem. Um, and also talk a little bit about the general use of simulated safety factors in a risk uh, analysis context and, and other things like that. But there's other applications uh, possible. So, you know, feel free to branch out and use this any way that you think because it's customizable. You can kind of turn it into any way that you want. So uh, by the end of this module, you should be able to uh, summarize methods for conducting a probabilistic analysis of a traditional limit state problem, such as a slope stability analysis. Describe how probabilistic analysis can be used in risk analysis. So how do we use these results when we're actually making elicitations on nodes in inventory? Um, so change this. So limit equilibrium stability analyses, we have factors of safety less than one, which basically means there's a loss of limit equilibrium stability. The required safety factor uh, being greater than one is usually good. The, you know, it's usually like 1.4 or something like that. And it, we usually, it's, it's, we have that, instead of it being just one, it's 1.4. We'll count for uncertainty in this analysis. You know, we don't know what our inputs for stability are. Like build in this kind of additional thing above one in order to kind of account for that. Um, and it's a deterministic factor of safety. So it uses information in a risk analysis. Uh, you can usually incorporate it as sort of like a, a more and less likely factor. Um, so, you know, factors of safety show that it was 1.6, so that's good. Yay. And so that might indicate that our uh, our likelihood for instability is low, but there's better ways that we can do this. There's more robust ways that we can do this. Um, and, you know, when you get to a factor of safety of 1.05, is that good? Is that bad? Um, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. So this will also provide some context for that. So um, this is two sets of distributions, and in this particular case, this would be for driving and resisting force in a stability uh, analysis. They each have um, the same best estimate. You'll also notice on the left and on the right. Go off and notice. Oh, yeah, here we go. Is this a laser pointer? Yeah. Okay, cool. So uh, same axes on both graphs here. Um, same axes over here, over here. Same best estimates right here for the, we'll call this the resisting driving force and this the resisting uh, as over here. But you can see that the distributions are in different shapes. So, you know, these are basically um, kind of a description for what we would do in a room with a bunch of smart people. So we'd say our best estimate for the driving force is somewhere right about here. And we think a reasonable low is here, a reasonable high is here. And so we get a distribution that looks something like this in, the, in what we would build in a Monte Carlo analysis. Over here, it's a little bit different. You know, our best estimate is still the same, but our low is a little lower and our high is a little higher. And so we have uh, a wider spread in our distribution. So when we use these in risk in, in a risk analysis or, you know, uh, and when we actually utilize these things in a risk analysis, note that the, the difference here, the overlap or what we might think were the, um, the driving forces are greater than the resisting forces. You think about that one? Right here. It's smaller. But over here, where we have more uncertainty, that overlap is larger. So that's the realistic output of these understanding of distributions. Changes the way that information can, information can be used in a risk analysis context. 
Because otherwise, we'd just be looking at these best estimates, and the answer would be the same. But when we actually use these distributions, it changes a little bit. We have better understanding of it. How will we do this? So to approach this as an overview, essentially you would take a tool, such, like, such as Microsoft Excel or something like that, and you would program this equation into that tool. So ideally we'd have Excel or something like that with at risk programmed into it. Um, basically input some parameters as distributions. Again, this is something you're gonna get from your subject matter experts. We may be informed by, um, you know, uh, field activities such as um, you go out and do a subsurface exploration, you get some soil samples, and you do some slip, some uh, some shear strength testing. Um, you do unit weight tests. You do things like this to help you understand what you have in, in here. And you, you fix a distribution to it based on your subject matter experts, and you put that into the tool. You perform this Monte Carlo analysis. So essentially, you're doing this, this equation, this uh, <clears throat> driving resistance over uh, driving forces, uh, excuse me, resisting forces over driving forces, over and over again, resisting forces over driving forces. And each time in each one of these, these uh, distributions, you're sampling in random question locations for each one of these, and you're building a, a distribution of results. And so you can use that distribution to basically inform or understand the uncertainty around the stability equation. So the distribution of safety factors provides a probability of unsatisfactory performance. So you are basically kind of getting an understanding of what the likelihood is for failure, the probability of failure. So there's two ways you can use this. Number one, you can use it uh, directly. You can say the thing that I, the, the count, the thing that comes directly out of my calculation is going to go right into my risk analysis. That is usually frowned upon because every month. Every model is run. That's most models. Some models can be useful. Um, no model is as complex as reality. There's always going to be things in reality that are left out of that, uh, of that model. And so we have to understand how we've used it, what's gone into it to recognize the, the, the shortcomings of those models, and then use those results uh, appropriately. That's option two. Use the information more qualitatively. All right, knowledge check. What is that distribution thing anyway? Um, anybody want to like maybe kind of summarize that in their own terms? No, that's not the funnest thing to do when a group of people. Anybody has anything they're just dying to let out? Looking right at you, Tiffany. So a, a simple description of what a distribution represents. Sorry to put you on the spot. Yeah, of anything, you know, number of hairs on my head. Uh, you know, so we could go around and we could all guess, oh, somewhere around, you know. Uh, whatever number, uh, a thousand, um, but people who think I look old be like, eh, it's probably more like 50, where people who think I have a thick head of hair and because the light's bad where they're sitting might think it's much more. And so we could build a distribution out of that. It's really what it comes down to. Um, okay, so let's run through an example. A liquefaction stability for an embankment dam. Um, so we have a 76 foot high homogeneous earth fill embankment that's located in a seismically active area. Um, it's composed out of clay sand uh, that's compacted in thin lifts with a sheep's foot roller. Um, we have an alluvial foundation that's 20 foot thick. So between the uh, bottom of the embankment and top of rock, we have this alluvial foundation that has had three borings drilled through it, uh, through the downstream shell into the foundation alluvium. And it has indicated that there's a continuous clean sand layer about four to six feet thick, somewhere in there, at eight feet below the dam foundation contact. And the N160 clean sand values range from about 13 to 15. So we have some information here. Um, there's a wet area to tow the dike that indicates that sand layer is below the phreatic surface. So what does that tell us is possible here? It's clean sand, 
It's below the water table. We have a failure mode that we should be looking at here, right? You, you get an F for the day, McKayla. Just kidding. No, it's, it's, it's liquefaction stability. Liquefaction stability. So there, um, if this thing is in a seismically active zone, like we said that we thought it was, if it shakes, we have some potentially liquefiable soils um, that exist below the sailing. Here's a, um, a stability analysis run of what that might look like. So here's this liquefiable sand layer. Um, and these might be some estimated uh, stability parameters that we might put into a model. Um, yeah, so this guy's 4 to 60. Uh, yeah, blow counts in the order of 13 to 15. So um, how do we utilize this in a risk assessment? So in the last example, or rather the uh, exercise of the last one, the exercise we had just after lunch, we got together, we did a PFMA, we built a couple of event trees. This is what an event tree for liquefaction of an embankment might look like. Um, liquefiable layer exists in the foundation. Um, foundation materials liquefy given an earthquake occurs with some coincident reservoir stage. Um, the slope becomes unstable as a result of that. And then the crust lowers, you have overtopping and reduced it. So there's some things that we can do to inform ourselves on each one of these nodes. Um, perhaps we've done some explorations here to indicate what's here. Uh, we can actually do an analysis to figure out what the what earthquake motions are going to liquefy this. But for this one, we're, 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 where we're interested, we need to do some sort of a uh, stability analysis to help us determine what the likelihood of uh, the slope becoming unstable is. We don't always have perfect information. So that's what this slide's about. So this is uh, from Bureau of Rec. This is their design of small dams. It's okay to cheat a little bit, I guess, for lack of a better term. You know, when you don't have good information, it's better than just guessing. Go in and look for published values. Um, don't let this be your only source. There's a lot of sources out there, um, including other projects in the area. Um, you know, uh, at, at times there can be um, historic notes from some of the older guys who have done research or investigations at this dam previously. Explore your sources. Okay. Um, so this is what those sources might look like. So. We have best estimates for unit weight, uh, cohesion, and uh, friction angle of 115, 116, 720, 34 degrees. And based on the research of multiple sources, we can develop somewhat of a range of what that max minimum might be. And then um, we want to find out what this post liquefaction strength is. So we're going to go in, we're going to use some of our, our published uh, resources. For the if you're not a geotech, this is a lot of details. The details change for whatever the problem you're looking at. So you're all experts in some areas. You're all, some of you are experts in multiple areas. Um, change your detailed thing here. You know, this is just an example. So we said before that our blow counts of our um, of our liquefiable layer exists somewhere at about 13 to 15. So we kind of follow this up. We have anywhere from about eh, 19 to about 44 kPa, which results in 400 to 940. So if we just ran one single stability analysis using our mode of 660, we get something like this. Oh, a factor of safety of 1.75. So does that mean that this thing is 100% stable? Would you say in a, in, a, in a risk assessment that the likelihood of, excuse me, of this, um, of this slope becoming unstable is very, very unlikely, virtually impossible. <laughs> it's hard to tell, right? Yeah, we got, it's, it, there's, if this was 1.6, maybe I'd be a little bit more comfortable saying something like this, but 1.075, that's a pretty thin line there. So how can we get more data about that? Well, let's run a Monte Carlo analysis, utilizing some of these balance between 406 and, and 920. Uh-oh. 
So this is what the end result of that Monte Carlo analysis looks like. And you can actually watch this thing being built as the tool's running. It starts to charge these bars up as it's running individual um, analyses. This is probably the result of like 10,000 iterations, or something like that, randomly selecting from our input parameters of uh, different parts of the equation. <coughs> Let's see if this will work. Yeah, here we go. So what's the probability of the factor of safety being greater than one? So we'll, right here's one, this is our factor of safety. And so the area under the curve above this is what we're interested in. So we are at, um, yeah, it's less than one, 23.9. So we're looking at what, like, uh, 76% is the likelihood that it's actually going to stand up. So the likelihood of failure is somewhere on the area of 24%. <laughs> so specifically, it's the uh, number of iterations with a factor of safety below one uh, divided by the, the total number of iterations. So which is what you got here, 2390 over 10,000. So, uh, about a 24% chance of failure. So would we use those results directly? I would suggest no. This would be one of the main parts that you use to inform your judgment as subject matter expert as a risk practitioner. So you're gonna be in there, you're gonna be uh, eliciting the likelihood of failure through using an event tree for a liquefaction and failure mode. This is gonna be one of those nodes and you have this stability analysis and these results from a Monte Carlo analysis to help guide you on it. You're going to talk as a group. Well, I think that's bullcrap because I think the borings were done really poorly. I think we have a lot higher shear strength. So I'm actually think it's more like it's really unlikely that we're going to blah, blah, blah. So there's more complexities associated with this than just the number itself. Don't forget about them. Don't turn your brain off. Uh, another way to look at that. Oh, OK. So. Um, we just assume in the last sample, or the last slide, that the, um, the best indication of failure is a factor of safety of one. That's not always true. So it could be something more like one point one. We're looking at like an eyewall uh, rotational failure. We're, we're really looking at something more like 1.2 or 1.3. Because if you were to look at those results, you know, as you get closer to a factor of safety of one, and you can actually have an understanding of deformation, the deformation takes off. Like 1.3, 1.1 factor safety. So you're, that's where you you should care about. And so you can customize these analyses to look at a probability of factor safety of something different than 1.0. So if you step up to 1.1, boom, you're at 64. percent That's a that's a different story than 29. percent So these analyses are flexible as well. All right. So how do we use this information in a risk analysis? So this is our failure mode. Um, this is our event tree. Earthquake occurs, liquefiable layer exists, continuous liquefaction is triggered, slope instability occurs, and crest loss exceeds the available freeboard, overtops, fails the dam, chaos ensues. Um, so, again, we could use those results um, as a probability estimate for event four. Not recommended. You don't want to do this. It's a model, it's wrong. There's reasons to believe that there is value to it. We should discuss those reasons. So as a starting point for the for probability estimate with adjustments applied based on other factors. What's the quality of the data? What went into getting that data? Stuff like that. Uh, qualitatively, uh, more or less likely factors. So this is one in many more and less likely factors regarding how likely an event is to occur. Um, a more likely factor would be that, um, yeah, let's not go into details, you guys. Know about these more or less likely factors, and we'll continue to talk about that, especially when you're in the, the uh, Smoky Ridge exercise at the end of this week. Hopefully, that will really kind of bring everything together for you, for you guys. And, uh, it'll be, it'll all end in hugs. It'll be great. Um, so, some caveats. Since a limit equilibrium stability analysis does not give a sense of how much deformation could occur. Sometimes a finite element analysis would typically be performed in support of a higher level risk analysis. So there's limits to what we can do, and sometimes those limits are okay because there's different levels of a risk analysis. When we're doing an SQRA, 
you know, what we just kind of went through is pretty good indication of is stability going to occur or it's not. And we can make the assumption that it's going to be enough to lower that crest enough that we get overtopping and fail the data. When we're in a more qualitative, um, quantitative risk assessment, sometimes we have to have a better answer on that. So a higher order analysis may be in order. Um, even if a very low probability of slope instability were indicated, this would not necessarily rule out all other seismic potential failure modes. Um, we're just talking about one thing. So what about um, a face wave or something like that? One of the something around the reservoir when rim fails and we get a big wave that fails the dam. Or perhaps there's um, spillway piers, pertainer gates that shake and fail. And so there's other things that could potentially happen. This is just one thing. Don't turn your brain off. Um, it's a creative activity we're involved in here. Um, so Monte Carlo analysis, uh, simulation capability and input parameter distributions. So be aware of what kinds of distributions are being used for the input parameters. Consider where they're, whether they're appropriate. Um, you know, the way we look at these things a lot of time is we're asking the listeners to give us their best estimate. Um, their lowest reasonable estimate and their highest reasonable estimate. Is there reasons to people to push those out further or, you know, to pull it back saying, well, well, you're being a little too risky there. Why would you say that? Defend your answer. You know, you want to make sure you talk a lot of these things out. Um, and, and also what kind of uh, distribution you're, that you're using, to, that you're selecting. What is the shape of that distribution? And does it have... Um, is it is it reasonable for the actual perimeter you're talking about? Damon is very good at talking about these distributions, and I see he's probably talked a little bit about that in the last uh, couple of presentations. If not, I am sure he would love to discuss this with you after this presentation. So go grab, go grab. Let's talk about one more example quickly. RCC dam. Um, so in order of decreasing preference, we get the results of an analysis where there are no factor of safety hits below one, what are we gonna do? Is the, does it have infinite stability? Probably not. So use the information qualitatively. Um, you know, is it it's on a more or less likely factor list? Why are the ranges of the input distributions? So ask your elicitors to kind of push their understanding a little bit. Um, really, is it really this, this small? Can, can these things be out here? Increase the number of simulation trials. Sometimes this works, probably not. It's just gonna give you a better definition of the results. Also, you could use a fitted analytical probability distribution to calculate the probability of factor safety below one. What does that mean? Let's talk a little bit more about it. So right here. So we want, we're interested in things of, above the factor of safety of one. Well, that's way out here. Or, sorry, way out here. So what's this tail look like? Is this really flat now? And really kind of come out here? And how would we know? Well, you can fit a, dis you can fit a distribution through the distribution. Um, so our focus is going to be on the left tail there. The shape depends on if the selected distribution was selected to fit Monte Carlo. Shape depends, or let me back up. Um, probability calculated in this manner by definition would be obtained from the left tail of the analytical distribution. Um, and the shape of this tail would depend closely on which analytical distribution was selected and on how it was fitted to the Monte Carlo simulated data. So the probability of factor safety of one of that's of that's less than one could differ by orders of magnitude. So, depending on the literal, how that distribution is. So, um, the chance here to be to be less than if it's here, if this distribution fits here, and it only comes out here, to be one in If it goes way out here, it could be one in ten. So, we have to be very careful about how we how we uh, how we choose these things. Um. Calculated probability could change dramatically as a result of pretty minor changes. Um, so, you know, I guess in short, this should be used sparingly. Results should be interpreted with caution. Don't go out and refit a dam for liquefaction and spend $100 million based on something like this. You know, this, is, this can provide in indications. This can provide a, a basis or a jumping off point for future discussion about um, how likely this thing is to fail. Uh, one more quick um, example here, a rock wedge foundation stability. But we have a potential failure mode with the following um, 
the vent tree reservoir surface exceeds the critical elevation. Continuous base side and re release planes exist. Movement is significant enough to cause concrete cracking. Arch forces cannot be redistributed and breach occurs. So we're really interested in um, how significant is that movement? Is it going to move? Matic animation. Here's our our uh, our vent tree, and this is really what we're, we're interested in right here. Critical rock, rock wedge movement initiates. That's a hard thing to sit there and ask somebody to just say, what's the probability of that? So we can do some things to inform our judgment. Um, so there, we're having some trouble. Making the probability of it. Um, critical wedge movement initiates. Looks like this. There's a lot of things going on there. But essentially, this, this wedge is coming out of the picture at you. It's taking away the support for this abutment of the dam, and it's going to fail downstream. And it's being charged up on all these planes by the reservoir. This is not going to charge in those things on those fracture planes. There's a lot of inputs. There's a lot of things to understand. One more. There we go. Um, we can take a probabilistic limit state approach. We can do some fancy things to establish some understandings for our particular problem. Black fracture flow focused seepage analysis for a true full wedge plane uplift. Essentially, we're going to do the same thing we all have always done. We're going to load that stability solution into Excel, and we're going to try to run some an estimate using some understanding of the uncertainty of the parameters in this. Our base plane friction angle, it's, uh, it's got a triangular distribution, and it ranges from 39 degrees to 48 with a, a, a best estimate of 40. And we can do that for, for all of these release planes. So that's what it looks like. It's fancy. Um, our best case and our worst case is low. So it's rather low. Interpreted directly, these results would suggest wedge movement initiation probabilities of not much. So, so here's some caveats on how we might uh, display that information. So they've got this display in millions. That doesn't mean a whole hell of a lot to me. So what can we do to make this a little bit more perceivable to our actual uh, listeners. So, probability of non-zero is very small, better interpreted as a base rate, considering context of the more and less likely uh, values. Um, team ultimately selected a truncated log normal probability distribution with a lower bound of something low with a mean of something low and truncated upper bound of something higher. So, um, there's different ways you can utilize these, these analyses. Let's talk real quick the ways because my time is over. Public limit equilibrium analysis is one method of quantifying the effects of uncertainty and can be utilized in many different settings on many different nodes for many different things. Sample distribution of inputs and are modeled as random variables and uh, can be input as a distribution and result in distribution. Use those factors to save you of results factor of safety results to inform conditional probability estimates. Results should be interpreted using engineering judgment. All models are wrong, some are useful. Use your judgment, you guys are the experts now. Quantified uncertainty can provide an additional layer of uh, information for the risk estimators. If it's 1.01, .01, what do we do with that information? While Monte Carlo software allows analytical distributions to be fitted to the data, does not mean that this is always the best or applicable approach, but it could be a good one.